burbling on and forgetting stuff. I've wanted to do a top five type video for quite a while. I see them all over the internet, top five, seven, nine, eleven, whatever, uh, things that you should know. And I thought I'd try and do some uh, sort of top fives based around my armoring experience. And uh, I thought, well, where better to start than to start? And this is a list of five things I wish I'd known, pardon me, I wish I'd known before I'd started or as I'd started being a full-time professional armorer. Now the professional there isn't necessarily an indication of my abilities and skills, rather it's that it was an attempt, or it is an, an ongoing attempt by me to do this as my full-time job. Um, so that's the professionalism I'm talking now. I let um, other folk judge the professionalism of my work. Right, it's going the other way for the minute, so we should be good. So anyway, uh, onto the list. I've written the list somewhere over there, so I may disappear on and off as I try to remember where I was taking it. I should have written it down, but I don't have my glasses on because I don't wear them in the workshop, so I'd have to have a bit of paper here, and that wouldn't make for too exciting a video. Um, so I've got a prop for the first one. So here we go. This is the first ever spolder that I made. I found it in a shed the other day, which is why it's in a bit of a sorry old state. And you know, it ain't bad, it ain't great, it's not bad. My first ever bit of armouring metal work. And there's loads of things wrong with it, which I'm sure many of you can appreciate, for all sorts of different reasons, from history right the way through to the technicalities and the materials used and all that sort of stuff. But before I go into pulling this apart and saying about your first work, your first work is a step of hopefully many to better work. The second spolder I built, which I can't seem to find, was better than this first one. Uh, and the third was better than the second and so on. So everything builds experience. So we shouldn't deride this stuff too much when we get there. Uh, I just thought I'd bring this out because I found it. I'm not going to go through piece by piece what I think is wrong with this because the video will be ooh, 20 minutes long just on this piece alone. But the bit I want to emphasize is the first stuff you build, and I think I've done a separate video on this, the first stuff you build will probably suck. It will be too shallow, it will be too ballooned, it will be the wrong shape. Um, just, you know, keep it going, sharp edges on it. it. It just won't be like the stuff you see in the museums. Because the stuff you see in the museums was built generally upon generations of armourer's experience. You know, from that first armourer who, in whatever school it was, put hammer to metal in 1348, and you're then looking at a succession of armourers built upon his experiences right the way through to 1598. Um, you know, you're looking at hundred centuries of experience and skill at a cutting edge um, uh, technology. Your first go on your own in a shed with a dirty old hammer, a dishing stump, and I don't know, a, 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 a ball peen made from a caravan tow hitch is not going to be as good, I'm afraid to say. You'll do fair if you give it an honest go and you'll do all right by it and you know, you just got to go from there. Um, but your first stuff will be quite bad. So what I would suggest is if you're thinking of becoming a full-time armourer, don't get a website and a Facebook page and everything together and go and go because you need to get your act together and learn what to do uh, and so on. Um, you can't just think you're going to do it, get a hammer and have a go. Um, it would probably, I would um, be afraid to say, be a bit of a waste of your time, to be honest, because everything will take you 20 times as long to make. It will be 20 times worse than what you were hoping it will be, and you'll only be able to charge a 40th of what you actually put into it. Um, so, uh, yeah, your first stuff will be pretty appalling. So give it a go as a hobbyist and get that mileage out of the way. Which kind of leads me to the second thing. Um, I wish I'd known. And I did find this out within about 18 months of starting. Unless you're some sort of armoring messiah sent from the heavens to assist mortal man in the uh, transfer of steel into body protection, um, you're going to struggle and you will find it a very difficult thing to do and an uphill uh, fight all of the way. Um, so find someone Nowadays we have online as an option, but find somebody who can assist you and help you and give you criticism and so on. Now you'll get plenty of often constructive criticism, 
from many of the online forums. One that springs to mind on Facebook is the United League of Armourers, but there are many others that are dedicated to armour making in all of its shapes and forms, from living history, museum replicas, to um, LARP and cosplay and so on. There's loads of places you can get feedback on your stuff. Just be ready for the one or two who always go, well, that sucks, and don't offer anything else. Just ignore them. Um, so get some assistance. If you can, ask to go along for a cup of coffee once coronavirus has settled down and all that sort of stuff. Take along a cup of coffee. Go and spend an hour in the armourer's workshop. If you don't have a workshop yourself and are looking to get going, just seeing a working workshop is an, a massive eye-opener. You know, ask if you can take photographs and things like that um, of certain bits and pieces. Um, before you just go snapping away, but take them a cup of coffee if, if they like that sort of thing and have a chat with them and let them perhaps show you if they're willing to give you an hour of their time the project they're working on. You will learn so much if you're just beginning. And then over time you might be able to form a working relationship with that armourer um, or you know pay an armourer to be able to go and spend a day with them uh, every now and then. I was very fortunate, and I've spoken about these guys before, I ran into the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Trust and this is a UK-based uh, charitable group that helped with heritage craft and they paid for me to train with uh, Master Armourer David Hewitt at White Rose Armouries. Um, and that was how I got beyond just being a guy with a hammer hitting stuff and starting to actually learn um, what it meant. But be aware, this is kind of like a two-part B it does take time. I've been doing this now, I think about 12 years off the top of my head, um, full time. And it's only been in the last year to 18 months, I started to feel like I can control the metal and move it where I want it to go. Maybe I'm a slow learner, I don't know, but it's taken me that long to get to where I feel confident that you could say, can you make one of these? And I can pretty much go, yes. And I will give a fair representation of something, even if it's something I've not necessarily done before. What you won't see in the background is on some of the more complex stuff, it will take me 20 times as long as I'd hoped to make it, as I said at the beginning. But that's the nature of the beast and why working relationships with existing uh, skilled armourers are so important. Because on an example like that, I would go and see uh, Dave and go, Dave, help, please. So never be afraid to ask. The worst that happens if you speak to an armourer is they'll go, no, sorry, I can't help you. Okay, But just remember, if you do manage to do something like that, they are interrupting their working life to assist you. Um, so offer to pay if you have the money and the means to. Uh, pay a decent day's wage for that man's time if you're spending time with him for the day. Or work something out that they are happy with. Otherwise the relationship will end um, pretty quickly. I'll put this down because I'm fiddling about with it. I'm not going to another prop. So the third thing I would suggest is let experience make way for the tools that you need. If you go into a uh, armourer's workshop, there are a, a bewildering amount of tools around. I am not a um, tool hoarder. I tend to try and fudge my way through with the tools that I have. That's just the way that I'm wired. I like to try and do that. You know, if you think about people like I don't know, some of these Anglo-Saxon craftsmen and the wonderful things they were creating, possibly they're just sat on the floor with a small anvil and a couple of bits and they produce some of the greatest works of human craftsmanship that this world has ever seen. So you don't necessarily need a bewildering amount of tools. If you're wired that way, then, you know, have at it. But at the beginning, allow your skill to make way, your skill and experience to make way for the tools that you require. Otherwise, you could find you end up spending hundreds and hundreds of pounds, dollars, wherever you are, uh, on tools which you don't necessarily need and they will sit idle for ages. I have some under here. Yeah, the motorbike's coming back, so I'll maybe going off in a minute. I, I have loads under here that I've not touched and some up. Hang on. Hopefully they're finished for the day now. Someone's told them to move them on because they shouldn't be there. Grr, youth today, eh? But anyway, um, I have tools up there that I've not used. Um, but I have other stuff, like this one. Ta -da! There we go, let's get him in. There he is, look at that beast. I think he was one of the first hammers I bought and he's used on just about everything. Um, you know, my skill has made way to not have to buy hundreds of hammers. I just moved the sh this hammer around. Um, that's not to say, I should say, that if you have hundreds of hammers, 
uh, that you are less skilled in any way. It's just the way that we work. And sometimes a tool, a specific tool for a job, will speed up the work you are doing or even enable you to do the work you are doing quicker, um, more accurately, with less damage to the piece, uh, whatever it is. So I would say just let your experience and skill make way for the tools. Don't rush it. You know, if you're frustrated with something, uh, it might not be the tool. It might be your own personal experience, which is letting you down. And in time, that experience will make way and you didn't need to buy a tool um, for it. Or, you know, perhaps you do. <laughs> it kind of undoes everything I've said. But you see where I'm heading with that. So anyway, we're on number three. So now we're on to number four. I'm rattling my brains to think what it is. Ah oh, yes, professional armoring. If you're doing something professionally, this is more of a sort of self-employment tip uh, that was given to me just as I got started. I'm so grateful for it. Um, is get yourself, if you can, four accounts. Uh, this is bank accounts. Um, you have one account that all the money goes into and all the money goes out of. Uh, so you buy tools, you buy it from that account. You pay yourself your um, wages. It comes from that account. You get paid money for doing a job. It goes into that account. The government gives you a stipend or whatever because of coronavirus. It goes into that account. So when you come to do your taxes, you've only got that account to deal with. You don't have to create a spreadsheet. You don't have to do anything like that because it's all there. On online banking now, you can download it normally as a CSV file. And there is your income and outcome or outgoings rather. Okay, and your expenses and you can go through it and you can sift through it and it takes an hour tops. Um, armoring doesn't tend to have lots of things going in and out all the time because you buy the materials in a good bit and you've got them for a good 18 months, two years, whatever it is. Um, there's a few consumables but otherwise it's all pretty good. Uh, have a, another account set aside for tax. Now obviously tax works differently the world round. In the UK generally tax uh, and other bits and pieces, all comes to around about 22% of any money that comes in, I put aside for tax. So the second that money drops into the account, I take my 22% off, 24% if I'm feeling flush, because I'd like to make sure the tax man doesn't get me, and I put it into an untouchable tax account, because that is not my money, that is the HM government, Her Majesty's government money. Uh, that they are going to take from me when I do my taxes at the end of the year. So to have it set aside is great. Now if you have tax breaks and stuff in your uh, region, then marvellous. If you've got to earn more than 10 grand and you don't earn more than 10 grand, great. At the end of the year, well, hey, there you go, you've got a tax-free lump of money, which is always enjoyable. Uh, have a savings account for your business. Uh, and what you do with that is I often take about 10 to 15, 20 percent, depending on how flush the business is at the time, and I put it into um, that savings account, and it sits in there uh, just for major tool items. So if I need to, you know, go out and spend a, a big sum of money for me, then um, I can do that without too much fear that it's going to wipe out my business account. Oh, I've forgotten what the fourth account is. Bear with me. Of course, it's your account. Make sure you have an account which is yours. So this is, you've earned 100 units of money, you've taken out your tax, you've taken out your savings, you've put some in the business account, and you have, congratulations, about 50% of it left. That's yours to go and buy sweets and comics with. So there you go, there's the four accounts. It just saves so much effort and time um, on my tax and accounts. I cannot recommend it enough. Um, so what have we done so far? We've learned that your first stuff will suck, let your tools make way for your experience, although I've jumped around a bit here because I can't quite remember where I'm going. And uh, oh, it's gone from my head. I was trying to do this in one hit. Let's do a quick recovery, a recap. Go on, I'll leave that bit in. So your first stuff will be a bit rubbish. Experience, not tools. Can't remember the next one. Bank accounts. Aha, back again. Try to train with somebody. That's it. I'm going to visit people. Uh, that will save you weeks, months, years of learning. And the last one, the last one that I would recommend, 
uh, you cannot do enough is get yourself to a museum. Obviously it's difficult at the time uh, because of Corona and all that sort of stuff depending on where you are in the world but get yourself to a museum. Go and look at the shapes, the wonderful delicate shapes that these people were able to create in the armour. It's, it's still uh, every time, it's a double-edged sword, every time I go to a museum I come away from it thinking why am I bothering because those men were just untouchable metal working gods and I am some protoplasm schlepping about in the swamp of metal work. But, you know, every step is a step forward uh, and you keep going and you try to attain the work and they made plenty of mistakes as well, you haven't got to look hard uh, to see them. If seeing a museum and getting to see these exhibits just isn't possible, it might be too far. Uh, lots of museums now have full 3D exhibits. They have fantastic photo records, which they've built over the last decade or so. And now some of them are doing 3D uh, scans of the armour, so you can just move it around and have a look, see the shapes, see inside, see outside, and all that sort of stuff. And read the blurb. Often what happens with armouring, I was guilty of this, is you see a piece and you go, wow, it's amazing, and you replicate it. And then later, you're reading on a forum or something, ten years later, they go, oh yeah, don't forget that this piece is a complete restoration and a bodge job done by a 19th century tinsmith in East London. And you go, oh my god, no, because you've made a mistake. And you've based everything upon Victorianism rather than uh, what the medieval guys were doing. So read the blurb and do your research, but you can visit museums online, you can visit them in reality, and there are one or two private collectors who are happy to let you come along and take a look at their stuff that they have. You'll find them on the forums and so on. I'm not going to start naming them because I can only think of a couple, and I don't want them to be um, not inundated because I don't have that sort of viewing figures, but you know what I mean. Uh, done. So there's the five things. Let's see, can I recover my uh, earlier shame and do all five in one hit as a conclusion? Your early stuff will be pretty pants, but don't worry about it, that's part of the process. Uh, let your experience make way uh, instead of just buying lots of tools. Let your experience dictate the, the tools that you require. Have the four bank accounts, that will save you hours and hours. Uh, of tax and so on, if it's allowed in your particular area. Work with somebody, that will save you decades of learning, particularly if you can get a good working relationship with that person. And go see the stuff, uh, and uh, take photographs, and better still if they allow it, draw it, and so on, because it makes you concentrate on the curves and things so much more. Even if your drawings suck, it doesn't matter. Just give it a go, it will be up here when you need it then. So there you go, a top five thing. It's not as honed as some of the top fives I've seen. It's just me burbling on and forgetting stuff. But you know, it's been a while. Uh, so I said about support. If you're still here now, thank you ever so much uh, for hanging on to the end. What I'm trying to save towards at the moment uh, in my savings account that I spoke about earlier is some proper lighting. For this, it doesn't matter too much. You don't need to see what I look like. I'm generally a middle-aged mess. But what I want to try and do, I've noticed my videos are very dingy uh, and quite dark. So what I wanted to do was get some proper lighting. I've seen these LED lights that you stick on these um, sort of gorilla arm tripods and so on. And I'm saving towards a couple of those so I can illuminate the work um, properly when I'm doing instructional videos. So that's what I'm saving towards. If you would like to support me in that, it, you know, fantastic. Um, if, you, if your support is just watching this video, great stuff because you know this will earn me a, a pound or two by the time it's gone through as well and all of that goes to that. So um, thank you for that level of support, it's no problem at all. But if you want to help a little bit more, I have a coffee account, I think it's called, or Kofi, coffee, who knows, certainly not me, um, account which I will put a link um, in this about um, and anything received in there will go back to getting bits for this channel, it's not buying sweets and comics for me. So uh, I'm going to finish the next few videos with a little sort of plea like that, just while I'm sort of trying to ramp up that support. So I appreciate that. Um, so there you go. There's the first video in the can of 2021, almost to 2012 then for some reason. Uh, thanks for listening. Sticking with it. I hope it helps. Um, it's the sole reason I do it. And um, let's hope for a better year than last year. Take care.